Any question here? So then, I mean, we are introducing our next speaker. We are back to <coughs> Marine Hull Insurance. Uh, the, the subject of the speech is uh, volatility of the insurance market. Uh, we said it before, 18 consecutive years of losses and innovation. There is no doubt that this market needs innovation to tackle this downside trend. And uh, our, our speaker is uh, uh, Jan Vick, CEO of the Norwegian Al Club, one of the, I mean, most prominent underwriters domestically and worldwide. I got the privilege two years ago to attend this 175th anniversary. So John looks younger, and now he will give us a nice speech along this line. Thank you very much. Um, about two months ago, I attended a, a conference that we sponsored in Hamburg about Arctic trading, which, of course, if you think about operational risk, that's where you're going to get it. And at that uh, conference, we had uh, a Norwegian called Torleif Torleifsson uh, present to tell us about his East and northeast and northwest passage crossing in a 30 feet catamaran, together with one of the famous Norwegian uh, call it explorers. They made it in 60 days. And after, I was deeply impressed. First of all, he's uh, really a charismatic individual, uh, but he did it uh, in a wonderful way, the way he presented it. They only had one Russian guide, a young man who escorted him, because if there is bureaucracy, it's in Russia. So the two things he said following the, uh, in my opinion, tremendous presentation he made was that, John, I'll tell you two things. They're important. First of all, I would describe myself as extrovert, open, full of ideas. But I would say my colleague is introvert, negative, and questioning all the time. We discussed every day, and that was the success. We had two completely different views. When we came to ICE, my colleague was in charge. At sea, I'm a sailor, I was in charge. We were all the time, we discussed. We needed two different views. Now, the next thing he said is, you think we did a fantastic thing. Do you know Pietro Querini, he said. Pietro Querini. I'll ask you Italians. Do you know him? You know him? Well, Pietro Querini was a nobleman from Venice. He went on a voyage from Venice in 1431. Down to Crete, up through to Cadiz, where he grounded, destroyed his rudder, to the Canary Island, and he was destined with his goods to go to Bruges in Belgium, which was a major city of trade in the 1450s, etc. Um, regrettably, he got some uh, easterly wind and came up along the coast of Ireland. And because of the problem with the grounding at Cadiz, he lost his rudder north of Ireland. And that sea is rough. He had 60 men on board two lifeboats, sailed for about, without rudder, and after some time without the sail. He sailed for about a couple of weeks, and then he gave up, he launched his lifeboats. To make a long story short, he spent, I mean, his one lifeboat, he had 30 commandantes, they died quickly because of the too low freeboard. He himself managed with another 10 people after an incredible amount of time with the northern light, the Australis Borealis, complete darkness because it was in December and January, up north. And then he, of all things, landed on the island of Rust. And that is far north. It's about Buda, Buda Airport. We are getting close to Russia. This was 60 years before Christopher Columbus. He sailed about 1,000 nautical miles more than Christopher Columbus did. And he was almost way up where Willem Barents, the Dutch that went into the Barents Sea, 160 years later, he was probably the first to enter that area. 
a tremendous Italian, and Miss Mussolini actually erected a monument in the island of Rust, which is still there. These 11 Italians were taken extremely well care of by the local population, including the women. So nine of the Italians left Rust, went back and ended up in Venice. The two that didn't kind of found the Norwegian women quite attractive, stayed there. And when you get up to that part of the world today, you find these people are sometimes dark, they're a little bit different in color in their skin, they're more interested in music. And we say, this is, this is probably back to Corini, eh? That was taking risk. And that was at the time when Italy was driving marine insurance. It's about 1450. It was Genoa and Florence before it went on to Spain. It was about the name perils policy. They knew roughly how to calculate premiums. And you can imagine, have we really moved a lot on marine insurance when you look at the figures of Patricia, uh, when you look at the current state of the market? So what I'm, I'm going to do then is to try and focus in on the subject. I believe that currently we have an enormous overcapacity driven by a low interest level where any business proposal that gives a meaningful return on top of the call it minimum that is a deposit rate is at least looked at. That's maybe why shipping is interesting. We have a competence in terms of managing cyclicality which is back to the stone ages. It's about looking at top line, looking at bottom line, and when people see the top line diminishing, they start being aggressive, pushing rates down, and then you have the show going. So I'd say that managing cyclicality in our business is not the prominent thing. Emerging risks we touch, touched about. I mean, we see certainly in our portfolio currently the cruise ships are hitting $1.3 billion. If anything goes wrong there, we know it. It's going to cost us a lot. We see the FPSO far excess of that amount. And we can take category at a cut category of ships and say there is a different risk reality. It's bigger, it's more complicated. And uh, my sort of fundamental question with overcapacity to large extent inability to manage cyclicality, what do we do? What can we do? I think the best way to do it is to say that we are really looking at changing products. I can see clearly, for example, that some of the biggest clients we have are migrating or diversifying. They are going from traditional shipping into offshore energy, assuming energy is similar in a legal sense to marine. And we touched on that earlier. And it turns out that the complexity of the contractual world is hugely different. There is more and more need for the lawyers, the specialists, the people who know the contractual world. And there are these legal Rottweilers that you will find around the world that will definitely attack any contract. There is hardly a bulletproof contract around. Just give me a good lawyer, we'll see. So there is a very difficult legal uh, reality when you move from marine to energy. Um, and furthermore, we also see a lot of project financing uh, where the banks, because of, which has been mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, Basel III, the risk-adjusted equity capital that is needed, that they try and minimize the risk exposure by stripping out of these contracts the risk they don't feel is necessary or will be acceptable to them. That opens up a new market. It opens up a new market for somebody who's prepared to look outside the box to say, hey, that risk is interesting. Because the, the market will change always, the, the commodity thing. It hardly chases the niches because that's, it's, it's, it's not low hanging, it's high, ha high hanging. It needs expertise, it needs capacity, it needs understanding. And it's a much better place to be if you are able to understand what is the risk and to price it. Then I'm getting to pricing, and I, I can only say it this way, 
it is 50%, the, roughly the way we look at it, of the, uh, of the risk evaluation. But don't forget one thing. Evaluating the risk and pricing the risk, two different things. To evaluate the risk, a, a wonderful expression, it was by Ted Montross of uh, Genry, who we deal with. He said that Mike Hurd of Oracle said, it's about one and a half year ago, that 90% of the global stored data has been gathered in the last two years. It's currently standing at 1.6 setabytes and will grow within 2020 to about 32, a 20 time increase. It's basically uh, as a result of uh, social media. And there is such a lot of information. If you can access it, if you can use it, definitely is a game changer. To give you an expression or an, uh, an, an indication of gigabyte versus thetabyte, just to give you an expression, uh, impression, gigabyte will be this, one glass. Thetabyte is the surface of the whole Chinese wall. That gives you an indication of what amount of data is stored. And no wonder that one day you will find the government asking a ship owner, what's down in that container in hull number so-and-so? The information available is exploding. It's relevant to us because our lifeblood is information, how we manage information. Then the other thing I think which is necessary to look at, because we have to innovate. We have to look at things differently. Otherwise, we get completely commoditized, like class, like maybe part of banking, but the, call it the ghost of commodita commoditation is there, is hanging over us. And how can we add value is basically our basic challenge. And if you look at our way of distributing data and information, there is um, incompatibility to a large extent from broker to underwriter or from owner to broker to underwriter to reinsurer we duplicate and repeat the information. Instead of saying we need one compatible system which goes through the line and we don't have to replicate and repeat. That is one thing we see as clearly a challenge and we are working on that subject. The other which is I think much more valuable and to us the core of our strategy is to say how do you add value? Maybe the best is to say what and why do you think an owner buys hull insurance? Because of a claim, the claim that might come. How can you, together with your owner, develop a loss prevention system, a mitigation system, where you work as partners? We base it on 9,000 ships and 1,000 accidents per year. We do see some stupid things. We do, some, we, we do see some things that can be call it, passed on to other members and say, listen, why don't we do it this way? Because we think that is a better way of doing it. We've seen it. It doesn't work like that. Uh, we also think that on the crisis management side, there is an enormous amount of work to be done if you can train, if you can base it on the experience uh, that your partners have. We are owners, help us, use us. We see more accidents, serious ones, than any ship owner will ever see by the fact that we have more ships that we insure. And if we do a proper root cause analysis, we will see something there which might be of use to the members that we have. And my last point is gonna be, we cannot do it alone. I think, as I said earlier today, the shipping industry has to wake up to the fact there are many clever people out there that can help, identify who those are, try and build systems with them that in case in an emergency, it will go quicker, it will be do, they will make better decisions, and hopefully a more sustainable action in case of a large claim. That, I think, is something we have to just get to. Otherwise, the global community will say the industry is not at the level it should be to handle the exposure that we're taking on. So I inspire, and we have involved the GL and DNB GL on the ERS. 
We have uh, the hospitals in Norway on Radio Medico on our list. We try and work with the salvos, or more and more call it, uh, not a fixed basis, but on a basis where they have a preferred status, and with lawyers. We don't think you can plow around and use any lawyer in the world. We like to concentrate our purchase of expertise. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to finish it by again referring to a famous Italian, Mr. Lampedusa, an author. I think he was a Nobel Prize, uh, Prize winner in literature. He was talking about the times when Garibaldi was trying to unite Italy into one. It was down in Sicily where the landowners didn't quite understand what the game changer was taking place. And the statement which is useful in any and many, many cases is, if you want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. That's the only way you will keep it. Our business model needs to change. Thank you.